because for the last couple of years, uh, a number of things have been happening at SciArc that are kind of increasingly suggesting that SciArc students and faculty are becoming uh, interested in some of the th same things that Griel Marcus is interested in. I can just mention from last spring the Graceland uh, workshop, Elvez's appearance here, and the surprising number of situationist uh, theses that are being done uh, right now. So I do think that there's a kind of convergence of interest here that suggests that this is really the right moment for this to happen. Um, at the same time, what I, I hope I'm also seeing at SciArc is signs of a kind of increasing willingness to break down existing categories in our mind about what architecture is uh, and making very unexpected connections. And I hope that that's something that is also connected with Real Marcus's ideas because this is one of the things about his work that really uh, makes it very compelling for me. Um, now a few facts about Grio Marcus. Um, he's a native of the Bay Area. He was born in San Francisco. He lives uh, right now in Berkeley. He attended UC Berkeley uh, where he was a graduate student in political theory and where he later taught uh, American studies. He then abandoned the academic life to become a rock critic and he wrote for magazines such as Rolling Stone, Cream, The Village Voice, and a number of other publications. Uh, he published a book of his essays on rock and roll in 1975, Mystery Train, uh, which has already gone through three editions, uh, which is a book that's very well worth reading even now. And I think it's a, a very inspiring book. It makes some very interesting connections between American culture and rock and roll and certainly its uh, chapter on Elvis is, in my opinion, the best thing on Elvis that has ever been written. Um, since then, Marcus has uh, gone on and really pushed his interest in the uh, transcendental potentiality of rock and roll uh, and pushed this to an extreme with Lipstick Traces, published in 1989. Uh, this is an extraordinary book. It's subtitled A Secret History of the 20th Century. And it really goes a very long way towards uh, obliterating existing boundaries and connecting things that you never imagined could ever be connected. Uh, and it's certainly done more to expand my idea of what writing can be than any other book I can think of. Uh, I don't want to give any examples of what this is, uh, but just hope that you will go out and read the book yourself. Um, last year, Griel published Dead Elvis, which is coming out this month in a paperback edition. Uh, a study of the Elvis phenomenon. He's a regular contributor to Art Forum magazine, Interview, and writes, uh, I've seen his writing in a number of other publications. He's on the editorial board of an academic, a new academic journal called Common Knowledge, and he has a new book coming out in the spring, which is a collection of his pieces about the punk movement. Uh, it'll be published in the United States by Doubleday under the title Ranters and Crowd Pleasers, but in England, uh, under the far more intriguing title, In the Fascist Bathroom. Uh, so, <laughs> enough talking about Real Marcus. I think that we're all anxious to heal from Real Marcus, so I want to welcome him to SIAR. Thank you, Margaret. Um, I'm going to talk for a while, and then I hope you'll have um, questions or arguments or statements you'd like to make that I can just listen to. Um, and I want to talk tonight about certain ways of thinking about the question of utopian architecture. Of course, the question of the utopian is almost inherent in architecture. Take the movie Singles, if you've seen that. There's a scene where Bridget Fonda is sunning herself um, on the roof of her apartment building. And she's relaxed for the first time in the whole movie because she's finally decided what she's going to do with herself. She's going to go back to school, and she's going to become an architect. And the paperback beside her as she's there on the chaise lounge is, of course, The Fountainhead. Uh, it's Ayn Rand's trash classic about the heroic architect who refuses to compromise with a corrupt herd and blows up his own building rather than see it ruined by the Philistines. 
I was I was disappointed at at the cliche of this because it was just so sort of preordained. But in a way, it was it was real. The book really does tap into and even yeah, and, and the movie even more if you've seen that. Um, taps into a fundamental modernist idea about architecture, and it's a double idea. It's the idea of the architect as a Nietzschean superman, and of architecture itself as a form of power. As a form of power, it's philosophy raised to the level of an image. It's overwhelming. It's inescapable. It's the architect as master of time and space, and everyone else as ants. Now, I want to go back a few decades for an odd version of this, to get some sense of the motives that impel the modernist architect in his classic form. And in the classic form, it's always a he. I want to go back almost six decades. It's 1934, two years into the New Deal. The confidence that accompanied the election of Franklin Roosevelt is fading. The economy, the country, is still in ruins. The survival of capitalism is a real question. Everywhere, throughout society, there's a wish for revenge. There's a sense of panic, and there's a search for leaders. It's December 18, 1934, and we're on the front page of the New York Times. First story that might catch your eye. 28 more are shot in Soviet roundup. Left deviationists linked to Trotskyist crime. It's a report on the Stalinist suppression of dissent. And then in another story, William Green, president of the American Federation of Labor, urges laws to restrict reds. A tremendous fear that the American Communist Party is going to take over the labor movement. The main story, Reich seizes 600 in Morals Drive. Storm troops are chief target in cleanup of public baths and bars. This is on the destruction of the brown shirts by the SS in Nazi Germany. This is the night of the long knives. Then on page 12, there's a story about Senator Huey P. Long. At that time, the left-wing alternative, the right-wing alternative, nobody knew to Franklin Roosevelt, really considered his chief threat. Story about Huey Long and the Louisiana legislator, legislature. With Senator Huey P. Long crapping, cracking the whip, the Louisiana House today advanced to the last step before a final passage of the 35 edicts, note that, edicts, not proposal, not measures, before final passage of the 35 edicts that Mr. Long presented last night when his special session of the legislature convened. Think about that. He's a senator, a U.S. senator. He has no constitutional office in Louisiana. Uh, in, in, in the state government, and yet he runs the state legislature as an absolute dictator. Every one of these 35 edicts had to do with increasing his personal power throughout the state. Long is there on the floor. The legislative chamber is filled with representatives of the Louisiana House and with thugs, Long's personal bodyguard, state troopers, and guns are drawn and votes are cast. A few pages on, there's a story about a new fascist party. Here's the headline. Two forsake art to found a party. Museum residents prepare to go to Louisiana at once to study Huey Long's ways. Gray shirt, their symbol. A new and still nameless party has plunged into the American political arena under the generalship of two young officials of the Museum of Modern Art. Its members will wear gray shirts. This is wonderful. This party didn't even have a name yet. It was later called the, the National Party. But they picked the color of the shirts first. And this was essential for 30s fascism. Uh, Germany had the brown shirts and the black shirts. Italy's fascists had the black, shir uh, black shirts. Romania's Iron Guard had green shirts. Uh, in America, there were, the, there were the silver shirts. There were the khaki shirts. In England, uh, Oswald Mosley's British Union of Fascists, black shirts again, but these are, these are gray shirts. Story goes on. The founder of the party is Alan Blackburn, 27, who was graduated from Harvard in 1929. His co-founder is Philip Johnson, 
He completed his studies at Harvard in 1927. Yep, that Philip Johnson. The story goes on. For three years, the young men dedicated themselves to the advancement of American culture through art and architecture. Mr. Blackburn as executive secretary of the Museum of Modern Art, and Mr. Johnson as head of its architecture department. Recently, they became convinced that abstract art did not solve the major political and economic problems of the day. Consequently, both have turned in their resignations and will leave as soon as possible for Louisiana to study the methods of Huey Long. We have no definite political program to offer, Mr. Blackburn and Mr. Johnson said. All we have is the strength of our convictions. You might say that our plan is something like the view that you get through an unfocused telescope. We know we see something, but its outlines are not yet clear. We know that there are 20 to 25 million people in this country suffering from the inefficiency of government. We feel that there's too much emphasis on theory and intellectualism. There ought to be more emotionalism in politics. After all, life isn't intellectual. We think that what people want is to eat, sleep, and play. Both Mr. Johnson and I, Mr. Blackburn said, have been interested in the book written by Lawrence Dennis, The Downfall of Capitalism. Last summer, the two new political leaders traveled throughout the country by automobile, stopping every two hours to talk to people. Their purpose, to study American life. We shall try to develop ourselves into new men, Mr. Blackburn said, by doing the sort of thing that everyone in New York would like to do but never finds time for. We may learn to shoot. We may learn to fly airplanes. We may take long, contemplative walks in the woods. They went to Louisiana, but they were rebuffed. So they attached themselves to the National Union for Social Justice, a proto-fascist party organized by Father Coughlin of Detroit. He was a radio preacher who held millions in awe every week with his anti-Semitic, anti-Roosevelt broadcasts. Johnson and Blackburn devoured Lawrence Dennis's next book, The Coming American Fascism. They saw the National Party, their party, as an elite group that would take in the higher types of American fascists, like Charles Lindbergh. They thought that they could co-opt the vulgar energy of American fascism and give it respectability and force. They bought their way into Father Coughlin's group with a $5,000 contribution. Remember, this is 1934. It's a huge amount of money. It made them the principal funders of Father Coughlin's party. But again, they were ignored. So Johnson went back to architecture. And eventually, he returned to the Museum of Modern Art as a member of the Board of Trustees. Now, by the 1950s, Philip Johnson, of course, was famous, and he was honored, and his fascist past was completely forgotten. The 50s are often described as an age of dullness and conformity and empty prosperity. But in fact, they were a time of a lot of experimentation, a lot of determined and desperate loosening of social restrictions. There was a wave of release that followed the end of the Second World War. Some of that energy went into family, and some of it went into doubt. Some of it went into a wish for new ways of life. Small groups of experimenters, artists mostly, painters, sculptors, poets, filmmakers, novelists, came together in pockets all over the West. Networks formed. Ideas passed quickly from one spot to another. People began to say no, and in strange ways. In San Francisco, there was an unnamed circle of artists who made art out of trash, out of junk, stuff they found on the streets. In Paris, there was a more organized group, which named itself the Lettrist International. This is a group I wrote about in my book, Lipstick Traces. The Lettrist International followed a similar tact, though, but as a directive, as a rule. To them, art could only be made out of what they called prefabricated objects. The whole idea of originality had to be smashed. One of the San Franciscan artists was Bruce Connor. He made an assemblage, a sculpture out of found objects, as a protest against the, elect uh, the execution of Carl Chessman, who was the focal point for a mass movement 
to abolish capital punishment in California. With wax and with nylon stockings and nails, pieces of wood, Connor created a hideous, mutilated child in a high chair. The piece was one enormous scream. And one day, not long after this piece was made, Philip Johnson walked into a gallery in New York and bought it for $250. He gave it to the Museum of Modern Art, which hid it away. You can't see it anymore. You inquire about this piece, you're told it's in inaccessible storage. It's one more part of Philip Johnson that was buried, but maybe not his fault. You can imagine that if Philip Johnson was no longer willing to scream in his own voice, as in a way he was in the 30s, he'd take his noise where he found it. Now across the Atlantic, the Lettres International in Paris was pulling away from anything even this specific. The more they pressed their conviction that art had to be made out of what was already there, the more it became clear to them that making objects out of no matter what was not the point. The point was to recognize the possibilities of creation that were right before your eyes. The group was formed in 1952. It lasted until 1957. It was always tiny. The membership was always changing. Maybe the easiest way to describe this group is to say that it was formed to play with its own setting, to play with architecture. And to the members of this group, that meant city planning, the layout of streets, the zoning of neighborhoods, as much as the details of any building. One member said they were engaged in the science fiction of urban life. They thought of themselves as a youth group. They believed it was their purpose to destroy all phony ideas of rebellion and of fun that everyone, they know less than anyone else, carried in their heads. And they believed that they had a leg up on the future. Here's an ad they ran in 1956. Satisfaction guaranteed, or your money back. This air of having seen it all before. This smug thinking. So, what is to be done? And they laid out what was available on the cultural market. Art, gossip columns, you for whom the name of the famous art critic, religion, drugs, the opium of the people, communist party, royalism, play, the scores two to one, love, crime, quickness, James Dean, good business, Suez crisis, looking for trouble. No room to move there, they're saying. The idea of play is just a box score. So they came up with a slogan. The Lettrist International refunds lifestyles, even those purchased somewhere else. So they tried to play in their own city. They chose favorite streets. They tried to understand which parts of the city functioned as zones of attraction and which as zones of repulsion. They figured that just as the desert was in some way conducive to monotheism, parts of Paris were like black holes, suggestive of atheism, and all but demanding oblivion, even suicide. They tried to agree on specific forms of graffiti for specific streets, to decide which slogans would be most likely to shake people up on that street, or deepen the ambience already present on another, or merely as they once said, raise the level of uncertainty. They argued about changing street names. They agreed that the apartment buildings of Le Corbusier were like cemeteries, warehouses for the dead, they called them, or prisons, Monsieur Sing Sing, they called him. They compared themselves to the Knights of the Round Table, and they promised that they'd build castles of adventure someday. Quoting old books, they found romantic heroic, threatening prophecies of the state of mind that possessed them, versions of the story that they wanted to tell. And it is in these times, ran one of their scavenged lines, that one begins to see engraved here and there on the streets, in letters that no one can erase, these mysterious words, thus begin the adventures of Richard the Lionhearted. He DeBoer, the central member of the group, the one with the energy and the charisma to keep it alive, liked to make up maps of the zones of feeling he'd identified in Paris. He came up with a psychogeographical map of Paris. As you can see, it's a, it's a perfect match for a Michelin map. 
until you open it. There was another map he called The Naked City, and it turned up recently on the t-shirts for the movie Slacker, with the Paris streets that DeBoer had cut up replaced by bits and pieces of streets in Austin, Texas. DeBoer's group wandered through Paris and tried to imagine what it would mean to live freely in the city. And they tried to imagine what it would mean to live freely in the city and still be in jail. They seized on a diagram they found in a sociology textbook, which showed the unbelievably constricted movements of a Paris student over the course of an entire year. They seized on this as evidence of a peculiarly modern, especially alienated kind of crime, a new kind of urban suicide, to live in a city and never see it. Well, along with damning modern architects and promising to build houses that would provoke the passions, one day the group held a meeting. It was 1955, 22 years before in 1933. The Surrealists had played a game they called Irrational Embellishment of the City. The Lettrist International now took up this game, but with the idea of making it their own. Rational embellishment, they said. The question the Surrealists asked was, what should be done with public monuments? And Andre Breton's responses were the most vivid. Here's what he said. What about the Arc de Triomphe? Blow it up after burying it in a mountain of manure. The obelisk, remove it to the entrance of the abattoir, where it will be held by a woman's immense gloved hand. The Saint-Jacques Tower, conserve it as it is, but demolish the surrounding quarter and, for a hundred years, forbid anyone to approach it within one kilometer under penalty of death. The Vendôme Column. Replace it by a factory chimney being climbed by a nude woman. The Opera. Transform it into a fountain of perfumes. Reconstruct the staircase from the bones of prehistoric animals. The Palace of Justice. Tear it down. Let the site be covered by a magnificent graffiti to be seen from an airplane. Notre Dame. Replace the towers by an enormous glass cruet one of the bottles filled with blood, and the other with sperm. The building will become a sexual school for virgins. The statue of Alfred de Musset. The woman will put her hand in his mouth. People will be invited to strike him in the stomach, and his eyes will light up. The Lettrist International tried to turn this around. This is what they came up with, noting that no constructive aspect was envisioned since clearing the ground seemed to everyone to be the most urgent matter. First, they addressed the question of public transport. The metro. Open the metro at night after the train stopped running. Keep the tunnels and corridors poorly lit by means of weak, intermittently functioning lights. With a careful rearrangement of fire escapes and the creation of walkways where needed, open the roofs of Paris for strolling. Leave the public gardens open at night. Keep them dark. The group moved on to the churches, where they reported four different solutions were advanced and all recognized as legitimate until they, can, until they can be tested by experiment when the best idea will triumph. Guy de Boer declares himself in favor of the total destruction of all religious buildings of every faith. No trace will remain and the spaces will be used for other purposes. Jill Volman proposes that the churches be preserved that emptied of religious significance. They should be treated as ordinary buildings. Let children play in them. Michelle Bernstein insists that the churches be partially destroyed so that the remaining ruins would reveal nothing of their original purposes. The perfect solution would be to raise the churches and construct ruins in their places. And here's my favorite. Jacques Fillon wants to turn the churches into haunted houses. The group went back to the secular world Keep the railroad stations as they are. Woolman demanded that the, com the complete suppression or falsification of all information about departures, destinations, schedules, and so on. This would encourage goalless drifting. <laughs> After much debate, the opposition backed down, and the project was adopted without dissent. Suppression of the cemeteries, total destruction of corpses, and all tombstones, no ashes, no bones, not a trace shall remain.
attention must be drawn to the reactionary propaganda that cemeteries embody by their very nature. They are nothing but a hideous symbol of past alienation. Abolition of museums, redistribution of masterpieces in bars, free and unlimited access to prisons for everyone. <laughs> Allow people to use them for tourist vacations. There shall be no discrimination or separation between visitors and prisoners. And to add to the fun, 12 lotteries a year would be held to pick visitors to be sentenced to actual jail terms. <laughs> now, one of the most powerful aspects of all this is the fabulously consistent megalomania of this document, the assumption for the purposes of the game of total power as if everything really was about, everything was really riding on what decision the group might make. That great passage about falsifying travel information, after much debate, the opposition backed down. Maybe what's the most fun and the most inspiring about this material is to try and summon up that spirit of consequence out of resentment and fantasy. Another aspect of this document that I find interesting is that all of these proposals, demands, fantasies, whatever you want to call them, are about behavior, activities, situations, and they move as forcefully as possible away from spectacles and symbolism. Andre Breton's dictates, on the other hand, are all images. They're really movie scenes or movie sets. They're art objects. They're surrealist paintings placed in the city as new public works. And for that matter, they're closed and tepid. Take Breton's most out self-consciously outrageous notion, replacing the towers of Notre Dame with a glass cruet, one of the bottles filled with blood, the other with sperm. A lot of blasphemy was floating around in the 1930s in France. And compared to a scene that Eisenstein had worked out for a film he planned to shoot, what Breton had in mind was very tame stuff. Eisenstein planned a restaging of the crucifixion and a scene in which, to quote one description of this, one version of the script, Christ's sexual organ winds snake-like around the cross and up the cross of the crucified criminal on his right who is engaged in an act of oral sex with the Savior's member. Now that is blasphemy. The Letters International played around with blasphemy, too. They liked to talk about the witch doctor of Bethlehem. But really, they were interested in a different subject. What kind of world do I want to live in? What kind of world would it be that didn't wear out, that never was boring? That's the question that Ivan Chichiklov, a Russian emigre and a member of the group, took up with his famous essay, A Formulary for a New City. He wrote it in 1953, but the group never published it. Within months, he was in a mental institution. He never really got out. His writing became public only in 1958, when it appeared at the opening of the first issue of a journal published by a new group that called itself the Situationist International, the impressive federation of European avant-garde artists that the Letterist International dissolved itself into. This strange essay by Chichiklov was really the secret founding paper of the Letterist International and the stolen founding paper of the new group. And since 1958, it's traveled all over the world, or any way its catchphrases have. This essay is romantic. It's more than that. More than any document of its time that I know of, it really does carry the spirit of the Knights of the Round Table, of a glorious quest, in this case, for magic buildings, a magic architecture. Chichiklov begins with a chivalrous tone. Sire, I am from the other country. And he goes on. All cities are geological. You can't take three steps without encountering ghosts bearing all the prestige of their legends. We move within a closed landscape whose landmarks constantly draw us toward the past. Certain shifting angles certain receding perspectives allow us to glimpse the original conceptions of space, but this vision comes only in fragments. It must be sought out. It must be sought out in the ambience of fairy tales, ruined castles, endless walls, little bars, casino mirrors. 
Modern architecture, he said, was the opposite. Abstraction has invaded all the arts, architecture most of all. Pure plasticity, pure form, and pure mastery soothes the eye and tells no story. So everyone wavers between the past that lives in our emotions and a future that is already dead. There was a lot of Allen Ginsberg's howl in Chichikov's formulary for a new city. Pure protest, means without ends, another scream. But there was also a drifting lyricism, sometimes turning up banal images, houses on tracks that could go down to the seashore in the morning and come back to the city at night, and sometimes turning up strangeness, a whole city recreated according to the passions, with a neighborhood for each passion, a neighborhood of terror, of love, of tragedy, of nostalgia. As utopian architects, as people who played with cities, the Letras International was a great slogan machine, and Chichiklov was the greatest slogan maker. Really, what has carried his little manifesto around the world and what's kept it read are just a couple of phrases. One, the most famous, in his ideal city, he said, a city remade according to a rational extension of old religious systems, legends, and psychoanalysis. In this city, he said, everyone will live in his own cathedral. Everyone will be their own Christ. It's absurd, and yet it carries indelible appeal to some people. It means nothing to me, but I'm caught by Chichikov's second most famous lines, which are less religious and again more chivalrous. You, he accuses his generation in 1953, are forgotten even by yourself. Your memories are ravaged by upheavals on every continent. You have no music and you have no geography. You are no longer on the quest for the hacienda, where the wine is finished off with fables from an old almanac. That's all gone. You'll never see the hacienda. It doesn't exist. The hacienda must be built. And that was the clarion call that set the little group he was part of off on their journey through history. Now, among the many people inspired over almost 40 years by these words, these almost meaningless but so deliriously poetic lines, these rebellious but also aristocratic, almost royalist lines, was Tony Wilson. Tony Wilson founded the Factory Records in Manchester, England, 1977. He was a pioneer of punk, though he was old enough to go back to the 60s for his politics and his music. Ever since 1977, he's been the central figure of pop culture in Manchester. The central figure, whether you want to make a record, whether you want to get on television, whether you want to form a band, whether you want to find out what's happening, whether you want to borrow money, whatever. Tony Wilson is the godfather in Manchester. He's the wise man behind Joy Division, New Order, Happy Mondays. Well, after New Order made him rich, Tony Wilson finally realized a dream that he carried with him for over 20 years. From the time he first read Chichikov's Formula Larry for a New City, back in around 1967. In 1984, he commissioned architect Ben Kelly to build the Hacienda. Well, it was a nightclub, but it was a gorgeous piece of work with echoes of Mondrian, art, constructivism, suprematism, Duchamp, all of the utopian cafes built in the 20s and torn down almost immediately, they were all somehow in his nightclub. Orange, red, yellow, black, blue, green, white. The place was completely alive to the eye. The angles were off kilter. The colors seemed to change as you looked. And yet Tony Wilson knew this wasn't it. This was just an image of the Hacienda. It was just an homage. The t-shirts that you can buy at the Hacienda, they don't say the Hacienda has been built. They don't say, you're in the Hacienda. I went to the Hacienda. They say, still, the Hacienda must be built. That utopian edge, the missing dimension, is still present. Hacienda means a castle, a home, your own cathedral. I don't know why Chichiklov chose the word. I like to think it was because he was such a fan of Zorro movies. 
The movie's about an old California Robin Hood sallying out from his own hacienda in the guise of an outlaw to fight the evil grandees. Who knows? But the word does bring the idea of utopian architecture down to earth, down to the size of a house. Where I grew up, in the Bay Area, utopian architecture meant madness and grandeur. Utopian architecture meant the Winchester Mystery House. It's that rambling Victorian thing near San Jose, built by Mrs. Winchester. She was the heir to the rifle fortune. My grandfather used to sell her fur coats. She had more millions than she could possibly spend, and she was a spiritualist. One of her guides told her that if she ever stopped building her house, she would die. And if she never stopped building her house, she would live forever. Carpenters were there the next day. They got there in 1880, and they left in 1922, when she did die. The house was built every day. It was built and built and built like a kid with blocks, but they had good nails, it never fell over. Doors opened on to nothing. Rooms were divided in half. Every new room had to be on a different level. Some of the floors tilted like this. There were ceilings three feet high, there were ceilings 12 feet high, there were ceilings three feet high and 12 feet high in the same room. And my favorite touch, every window, and of course many of the rooms had windows that opened up to nothing, had Winchester triggers for latches. I thought that was a great touch. That was my idea of utopian architecture as a kid. Well, there's an echo of that madness in Berkeley, where I live. In many ways, Berkeley is a playground of utopian architecture. There are a lot of reasons for that. Different currents of bohemianism were loose in Berkeley around the turn of the century. There was a cult of going back to nature. There was a misogynist cult of the Nietzschean male. There was a cult of Greek revival, many more. And in every case, there was a search for an absolute truth, a faith that could be grasped right here, right now. And there was no better way to grasp the absolute than to build it. In Berkeley, what were built were not public works, or parks, or common buildings, but houses. And as the bohemian trumpets died down, what was really left behind was the arts and crafts movement of William Morris and John Ruskin. What was left behind was the legend of Isadora Duncan, who came from Oakland. What was left behind was a kind of down-to-earth, small-scale paganism, a summoning of pre-Christian gods, nature gods, house gods, the warrior gods of Mount Olympus, even satanic spirits that were never named. You can feel this as you walk up what used to be called Nut Hill in Berkeley, but nothing really seems very crazy there anymore. There are Bernard Maybeck's houses, a lot of them, one after the other, 70, 60, 40 years old, some of them looking as if they were just thrown together the day before yesterday from whatever was lying around, some of them seemingly returning to nature, all of them appearing unfinished, ready to breathe in a new way with whoever might move in. And just as you've accustomed yourself to this pastoral anarchy, you turn the corner and you don't believe what you're seeing. You see the Temple of the Wings, a Greek temple almost out of Delphi. That's also a house, a place where people actually live, perched on the edge of a cliff, looking as if it's just about to take flight. You go up the hill a little farther, and there's a castle, a medieval fortress, utterly impregnable for the crusade of 1224. It's out of time and then back into time. Around almost every corner there's a surprise, there's an explosion, there's simply a whisper of subjectivity, an insistence that nothing has to be as it seems, that anything can be changed. When you look at the formal utopian architecture of this century, whether it's Le Corbusier's Radiant City or Richard Neutra's Rush City Reformed, in every case you see the basic modernist nightmare the master and the ants, a totalitarian thud, an objectivity so lifeless 
You have to force yourself to believe and to realize that from the 1920s on, rulers fell in love with designs like that and made them real. From Mussolini to Ceausescu, desperate to turn people into ants. Ceausescu, the worst architectural criminal of them all. Like Philip Johnson in 1934, with the world seemingly collapsing around him, this utopian architecture revealed what so much modern art concealed. In the words of a writer named Steve Wasserman, this architecture revealed the search for certainty that underlies nearly all of 20th century art and politics. But as I've tried to suggest, the notion of utopian architecture cut loose from the idea of genius has other traditions, even if they're more obscure, even occult. Ultimately, it's a question of seeing. It's a question of looking at a building and imagining the life it permits or provokes. Maybe the reason people are still talking about the casual papers of the Lettrist International, a group that is against the fame of great architects, barely ever existed at all, is that when these people looked at great buildings, they weren't intimidated. When they looked at the giant textbook of a horrendous public building, they saw the fairy tale that wasn't there. Just as in the Berkeley Hills, Bernard Maybeck and a lot of other people, by the way they built their houses, told fairy tales, right out loud, and so loudly that they're still whispering. So thank you. Um, I've never learned how to talk with slides, but I did bring pictures of the Temple of the Wings and the Hacienda, if anyone would like to look at them later. Any uh, questions, challenges, disagreements? Yep. They were called the Lettrist International, uh, an incredibly um, grandiose name for a group of five or six people who um, hung out at a cafe in Paris. But they were, in fact, they had members from Algeria, Russia, Canada, Scotland. They were part of the Surrealist tradition in the sense that, that any uh, ambitious, intellectual young person in Paris in the 50s uh, with, with rebellious or avant-garde pretensions could hardly escape the Surrealists as, as, as they put it, the bad father that had to be killed. Um, so they were very much, you know, they were, they were scholastic in the sense that they were aware at the age of 18, 19 of what the Surrealists had been doing 20 years before, but this is what they wanted to destroy. Yep. Well, it depends. It depends on what you want to build. It depends on what you want to change. It depends on whether you have a story to tell. I think that's really what it comes down to. I mean, I'm no architect, and I'm not about to give you a programmatic story, but, but I think it comes down to whether you have a story to tell. If you do, you find a way to tell it. I live in a house that was designed by Julia Morgan. Julia Morgan is, is the architect who built Hearst Castle, that's what she's best known for. But in the Bay Area, she's best known for her houses. And Julia Morgan, unlike Bernard Maybeck or John Hudson Thomas, uh, other well-known Bay Area architects of the same period, early part of the century and, and on, was, was not a great visionary. And you can't 
look at a Julia Morgan house and recognize it as such. Julia Morgan built what you asked her to build. You wanted a neo-tutor, she'd build you a neo-tutor. You wanted an imitation Spanish Rococo, she would build you an imitation Spanish Rococo, and on down the line. But every one of Julia Morgan's houses has secret compartments and secret passageways. And she even made the people who, who bought her houses sign documents, which of course had no legal standing, that they would not tell anyone where these secret passages were unless they bought the house. Only could tell the new, the new owners. So that was her fairy tale. Uh, that was her way of telling that fairy tale. That, that's maybe an incomplete answer, but it's the best I can do. Yep. Well, I can't, I can't talk about little cottages in Beverly Hills because I haven't seen them, but I have seen the, you know, the big um, screaming houses. And, and the difference is that these places literally are around corners. You don't see them coming. They are not announced. They don't announce themselves. They are built in such a way as to be surprises as to suddenly make you confront the fact that someone once had a bizarre idea and set out to realize it. Um, in Aspen, uh, where I was recently, there's a development called Starwood. It started about 20 years ago, and it's up above Aspen. And when it started, it, it's a sort of private area for houses. When it started, people built small little cottages. and you know, getaway houses, two bedrooms, they built them out of wood and brick. Um, and as Aspen became more and more uh, a vacation place for the rich, uh, very rich people began to buy into this development. Rupert Murdoch, um, Arabian princes, and the houses went from small scale to 10,000 square feet, 20,000 square feet, 50,000 square feet houses with two indoor swimming pools. And, I mean, and these houses are all perched on hilltops. And, and every one is more appalling than the last. Uh, and they are monuments to, um, uh, you know, to nothing more than the bank accounts of the people who, who have built them. Um, and the houses in Berkeley and I, I don't want to sound totally chauvinist and parochial, um, are, are like tombstones. And I say that in a totally positive way. I like to go to graveyards. I like to look at old tombstones and imagine who the people were and look at the inscriptions and, and think about that. And these houses make you think that once someone uh, did a remarkable thing and left something behind. Yeah. Um, I Well, I don't know. Um, I don't know how to answer that. I mean, in a way, sure, that's what I'm saying. I'm, I'm you know, arguing for the forces of good against the forces of evil and the forces of light against the forces of darkness. But on the other hand, I'd really like to know what 
I mean, I, 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 I hope someone will, will write about what happens in Romania over the next 20 years um, when the ruins of that country are... Well, I'd like to know what will happen to the ruins of that country. That's the best way I can put it. I mean, the Letrist International talked about, you know, tearing down the churches and leaving them as ruins. Well, Ceausescu bulldozed hundreds of villages. He wiped them from the face of the earth. And he forcibly removed all of the inhabitants and put them in barracks. He virtually leveled Bucharest and built the most enormous um, Louis XIV palaces, monuments to himself. Uh, and they're there. You know, the boulevards are now so wide there will never be enough traffic. I mean, even when the, when the crowds gathered to overthrow him, they couldn't fill the boulevards. They were so big. Um, I, I would like to know what, what, what mushrooms will sprout out of that ground, if any will. I mean, I'm not really arguing for anything, um, to tell you the truth. What I'm s trying to say is that the utopian aspect in architecture is, seems to me, absolutely essential. But there are other ways of looking at it than saying, um, look at that great building, which, which seems to me the dominant way of talking about the utopian and, and a way in which the utopian is discredited. To me, uh, fantasizing about um, fiddling with streetlights um, is just as utopian as, um, as, as constructing, um, well, talking earlier, Richard Serra's Tilted Ark, um, or an enormous building, or Ceausescu's Romania. Yep. Um, I've never been to Las Vegas. Um, so, so the answer is no. I mean, I'm sure if I went there, I'm not sure if I went there, if, if I'd have anything to say. Well, Ivan Chechiklov, who I was, you know, quoting earlier, mentioned in his manifesto, in his chivalrous manifesto, that one version of his ideal city was Las Vegas, um, where he said, the city that never sleeps. I mean, he, he was very excited by that idea. Yeah. On what? Uh-huh. Well, I, I mean, now we're getting really personal. Um, <laughs> Because, because the fact is, um, you know, in total abdication of my role as someone who's supposed to know something about some things, I stay away from a lot of places uh, on purpose. I am curious about this enormous mall in, in the Twin Cities because I, my wife's parents are from the Twin Cities. I go there every couple months. Um, and I'm curious, but I'm curious the way you know, I might be curious to, to see a movie with real torture. Like, I'm curious, but that doesn't mean I want to go. Um, a friend of mine, a friend of mine who's, who's a writer in Minneapolis, went, went to the mall. And she said, she went with a friend. And they went with the idea that they were going to go to the mall, and they were going to go like, really superior tourists. And they were just going to walk around and make snide comments about everything. <laughs> and, and the people who were, the other people who were there and, and everything, and they went. And she said that when they came out, her friend could barely speak. And, and, and he was trying to say something, and all he could get out was, it's, it, it's, it's just so 
much. Um, so, you know, I think it's a question of nerve for me. Um, I don't know. I don't know. Of nerve. You know, some people, I mean, you know, there are reasons why I've never been to Las Vegas. Um, there, there's something, uh, you know, I just didn't read about it. You know, watch Ocean's Eleven or something. Um, I, I, read, I read Nick Tosh's new Dean Martin biography. You know, I loved it. But I think that's as close as I want to get. Uh, I mean, I don't want to come off as, as some sort of barefoot pastoralist. Um, but I... The stuff I was talking about tonight is, has, has strong emotions in it for me. And I would like to see what Ceausescu's uh, Bucharest looks like. But, but I don't know if I'd have the nerve to see that either. You know, I've seen pictures, and it's it's just can catch your heart in your throat. Um, I will go to the mall. I mean, I know it's just going to be a magnet. You know, it's going to be no way around it. Yeah. A new set of tombstones. What's the approach? What angle is that? What route is that? Uh huh. I'll look for it. Yep. I think it's really, it, it's very hard to tell. I mean, when I, I don't know Los Angeles well, and when I drive through Los Angeles, I have a lot of difficulty getting any impression at all of, of what's there, of what kind of ambiance there is there. On the other hand, Memphis is a city that's very, very ugly, first time you look at it. But Memphis is a city that just bleeds eccentricity that is full of crazies and is proud of it. And if you go through Memphis for more than about half an hour, you begin to see everywhere evidence of, of obsession, fetishism, craziness, and, and real attraction. Uh, and I'm not saying anything is beautiful, but I'm saying there is a personality pulsing there. Um, whether or not you can inflict anything on people. If all you've got is a complete motley, you know, no zoning laws, um, it, it's, it's a good question, you know? That might be, in some ways, um, a good solution. I don't know. Yeah.
Well, there were lots of parallels to that kind of group, but none with their kind of um, none that thought the way they did. I mean, these people were French intellectuals, and so they acted like French intellectuals, and they loved theory, and they loved games, and they loved being brilliant. Um, and I'm not trying to make fun of it, but that's just what they were like. Whereas American intellectuals often tend to be very aw shucks like. And what do you mean? And and hey, I mean the the San Francisco group I was talking about, which was never really a group and never had a name, was yet just as coherent and and in some ways far more dedicated toward making a new kind of art and changing American culture, changing the world. But they didn't like to talk about it because they found it embarrassing. Whereas in France, that's not embarrassing. Um, so there are lots of parallels. I mean, you could, I mean, you could find parallels for that kind of little group that says, we want to get together and we want to look at the world we live in and change it. You can find parallels with um, Dizzy Gillespie and Charlie Parker and the other musicians who invented bebop in New York. You can find parallels with Sam Phillips and Elvis Presley and Howlin' Wolf and the other musicians and producers of Sun Records in Memphis um, with the tiny circle pulsing there. Um, whether or not you can inflict anything on people, if all you've got is a complete motley, you know, no zoning laws, um, it, it's, it's a good question, you know. That might be, in some ways, um, a good solution. I don't know. Yeah. Well. There were lots of parallels to that kind of group, but none with their kind of, um, none that thought the way they did. I mean, these people were French intellectuals, and so they acted like French intellectuals, and they loved theory, and they loved games, and they loved being brilliant. Um, and I'm not trying to make fun of it, but that's just what they were like. Whereas American intellectuals, often tend to be very aw shucks like. And what do you mean? And, and hey, I mean, the, the San Francisco group I was talking about, which was never really a group and never had a name, was yet just as coherent and, and in some ways far more dedicated toward making a new kind of art and changing American culture, changing the world, but they didn't like to talk about it because they found it embarrassing. Whereas in France, that's not embarrassing. Um, so there are lots of parallels. I mean, you could, I mean, you could find parallels for that kind of little group that says, we want to get together and we want to look at the world we live in and change it. You can find parallels with um, Dizzy Gillespie and Charlie Parker and the other musicians who invented bebop in New York. You can find parallels with Sam Phillips and Elvis Presley and Howlin' Wolf and the other musicians and producers of Sun Records in Memphis, um, with the tiny circle of writers at Columbia University, uh, Kerouac and Ginsburg, and, um, and William Burroughs. Those tiny little groupings um, were all very similar. But this one was different, and as, as a, you know, a, someone who will always be partly a graduate student, I was attracted to these people because they were not embarrassed to, to think. So there are a lot of parallels, I think. Yeah? Well, hopefully the person 
Well, that, that's a really, really interesting and really difficult question. It seems to me that in the houses that I was talking about, it's not so much that the house is made to change one's way of life, but to express it. Um, that, that the house was built by the architect with the client, who was not considered a client, but you know, with the partner, whatever you want to call it, to realize a certain vision. Um, whereas I've always been fascinated with the houses that Neutra, Richard Neutra built, particularly in this area, uh, like the Lovell House. And one of the things that I've been so fascinated by is that the people who have these marvelous houses built never seem to live in them very long. Uh, they seem to be very close to unlivable. They seem to be um, on the scale of a single house for a single family or single individual or whatever, enormously oppressive, complete and perfect realizations of a single absolutist vision of what life ought to be like. And, you know, they're great to look at. The photographs are inspiring. And then you can imagine, though, well, here I am, um, got the locks on the doors and the architects left, and now what this house is looking at me. I mean, that's my fantasy, but I mean, I've, I did some research on this once, and it was just, it was just a fact. Nobody lived in these places very long. Um, so in that sense, building a house to impose or even suggest a way of life uh, is, is just as oppressive as, um, as an enormous public square that everyone's afraid to walk in because they will feel exposed and naked. And plenty of public squares have been built like that with just that um, result in mind. Well, I mean, people in, in uh, Unité uh, d'Habitation, people were desperate to make these apartments their own. And the way they made them their own was to completely throw over every idea of modernism, every idea of simplicity, every idea of severity, every idea of austerity, and fill them with the worst kind of petty bourgeois stuffed furniture. The, the worst kind, according to you know the vision of the people who built the thing. Oh my God! You know you put that in there. They said, of course, this is what I like, and if I have to live here, I'm going to have something I like. Um, and you could spend a long time explaining that there was like more appropriate furniture, but you know most people don't want to live their lives as works of art. Um, as far as I know, yeah. Could you talk a little louder? Absolutely. I mean, I don't. I don't know that Ceausescu's, um, you know, barracks and and huge public works are really comparable to Tony Wilson's nightclub. But Tony Wilson's nightclub, which I have seen, I haven't seen the Ceausescu um, monuments, um, is enticing. It is an invitation. It's full of suggestions. Um, and it is, it is a place of, of constant novelty. You know, that, that is its ambiance. Um, and it, it carries suggestions that don't necessarily translate into more architecture. It might carry suggestions about what you're going to say uh, to your boyfriend when you get home that night. You may have a really big argument. 
You know, you must just may have glimpsed something that was missing in your life. Or you may write something you wouldn't have otherwise written. And so on. I, I mean, buildings inspire, but not necessarily in architectural terms. Is that all? Yeah? About who? Well, I think it depends on the, on the person. When you go to the Winchester Mystery House, you are invited to think, look at what this crazy old lady did. But often, small kids who are taken there say, I want to live here. This is the kind of house I want to live in. Uh, and they're not interested in a crazy old lady. This looks wonderful to them. Um, when my, when my older daughter first went to Notre Dame, I was in the middle of researching lipstick traces and Ivan Chichikov was much on my mind, and she was there in the middle of Notre Dame. And she says, I want to live here. And I thought, ah, everyone in their own cathedral. I never knew it would be taken so literally. Yeah, I think there's a lot to be gained from placing yourself in, um, in buildings made by mad people and um, and, and seeing what they say to you. Right. Well, you know, I'm, he I'm here speaking t to you, people who are studying architecture, and I'm not studying architecture, and I'm not an architect. So to me, buildings are suggestive, can be suggestive, of all kinds of things in life, not necessarily other buildings. And so I'm speaking really from that perspective. Um, and I think, you know, and I, I can... I can speak more, more lucidly, maybe, of how a building can lead you to do different things, walk down the street in a different way, than I can possibly do in saying how a building can suggest how you might build. Um, but that's, you know, that's, that's the, uh, the lack of what I, what I bring. Yeah? Could you talk louder? I'm sorry, I can't hear you. I'm sorry, I really can't hear you. Okay. All right, well, thank you.